And our last presentation today, but certainly not least, Dr. Marinin is going to discuss the transformation, essentially, of a mission site to a functioning public living history facility, uh, Mission San Luis. Dr. Dr. Marinin. Well, I, a couple of disclaimers are necessary here. Um, I did not work at Mission San Luis. Got it. Um, it's not my site, exactly. But my, uh, many of my students did, and through the years, I watched the work that was going on there. And um, so with that in mind, most of my work has been done in uh, non-living history circumstances. I just want to talk a little bit about the mission sequence as I see it in Appalachia. This is not, um, this is my own idea about how it works. Archaeologists love three-part things. So we have an early, middle, and a late. Um, so we have the, the missions in Appalachia being established by 1634. Um, I, then we have the Appalachia Revolt, which I think ends this first uh, section. The affiliated mission site that we have that seems to be a good exemplar of this time period is the mission of uh, Patali, St. Peter and Paul Patali. Then in the middle um, section, the missions are rebuilt hastily, actually. The Appalachians anticipate reprisal. But then we have the founding of the Carolina colony and the beginning of slave raiding. And then the late mission period is a, is a period under threat. Um, oh, let me back up and say in the middle period, we have the movement of mission uh, San Luis de Talimali from Myers Park basically to its current location. Um, so at the very end, the late missions that we have, I think that fit the bill are um, the Talimali mission and also the, the O'Connell mission. So these are uh, kind of exemplars of the time periods um, within the missions. So what is living history? I, this is my own uh, de definition. It's just a contemporary experience really of past living circumstances based on historical documents and archaeological evidence and interpretation. It's an experience in many ways of an extinct part of, of culture. Our colonial past, for example, is an extinct part of American culture. So this period of time is an extinct part of living circumstances in, in Florida in, uh, in, at the time that it was under Spanish hegemony. All right, the mission site itself was published, uh, excuse me, was purchased in 1983, and the first director of archaeology was a, a young doctoral uh, graduate of the University of Florida named Gary Shapiro. Uh, Gary worked there until his death uh, from leukemia um, some years later, I think 1987. Um, Gary began the, the process of trying to understand the site archaeologically. He commissioned a topographic mapping survey. He also began the process of subsurface testing where he simply, using the grid established by the surveyors, uh, dug tests at measured intervals to see how material was um, distributed around the site. So the very first part of the story, really, of Mission San Luis is a focus on archaeological work. But today, if you go, and has anyone been to Mission San Luis in here? Okay. Um, it features reenactments and reenactors at the church, the convento, the Spanish home, the blacksmith's workshop, and the fort, and sometimes other things as well. So we have the interpretive program on one hand, and we have the reenactments and things on the other hand. Mission San Luis is a, a landmark, uh, a national landmark site. It's, um, as I said before, located on the western, well, it was on the rest, western extreme of Tallahassee, and now it's within the city limits, and Tallahassee, Tallahassee has moved way west. All right, so uh, this is interesting to me because we used to say that uh, Mission San Luis was home to 
1,400 Appalachian Indians. Well, now it's 1,500. I don't know where they came from, but in any event, this is the story now. And they've chosen to, to um, kind of interpret the site for you, the visitor, uh, just before the raids that end its existence. So it's kind of, you know, on the cusp, really, of these raids. Uh, it, the site itself has Indians, lots of them. Some resettled uh, militiamen and their families who may live nearby in barrios and neighborhoods. Um, but it's also possible that they live in the countryside surrounding the mission. We know that ranching goes on, that cattle ranching goes on. The Appalachians complain bitterly about the trampling of their gardens by livestock that are not contained and things of that sort. So we know that cattle ranching is important. Uh, the raising of horses is also important. Apparently, um, in 1704, when, the, when San Luis is threatened, it's never uh, invested by uh, the raiders, but when it's threatened, uh, people are present from Pensacola who've come to buy horses. So uh, Appalachia is producing not only a lot of maize that goes mostly east to St. Augustine, but also cattle and horses and probably other things as well. And there is generally a single friar at these missions, sometimes at San Luis too, and San Luis also serves as a chapter house so that when the Franciscans come together to uh, consider various things in their province, they meet at San Luis. All right, so it is a remote life for most of the friars. Uh, I think it's important that that you think about what it's like to be among hundreds of people unlike yourself at a distance from the life you've known where you came from. I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting um, thought, really. Uh, again, mission bells become, I think, very important, and there are certainly uh, an element uh, that we'll look at in a moment. So here's the convento. Now, the term convento or convent in the 17th century meant any kind of religious, male or female. Only more recently has it come to mean female religious. So this is what it looks like reconstructed. And you can see a second structure behind it. This was uh, a kitchen. It's been reconstructed as a kitchen. So I wanted to go back to the O'Connell site for just a moment and show you um, the three structures here. This one that probably goes this way. We never found a uh, covered way here, just lots of trash pits. And then the, the church itself with all these burials inside and, and outside. This is what the complex at Mission San Luis looks like. The, um, the orientation of the structures differs, but the relationship of the structures does not differ. The church and convento tend to parallel e each other at about 32 meters of distance. Um, at O'Connell, for example, we know that we have burials. We have not seen the same thing at, at um, San Luis yet. But you can see this kind of um, covered way to the kitchen, basically. And I'm going to show you some pictures of the reconstruction in a moment. <laughs> Um, this was one of the first ideas about what it would look like, the first artist rendering. One of the nice things about Mission San Luis for all of us is that they have commissioned a number of, um, well, a lot of portraiture, a lot of um, overviews, you know, pictures, which we have all gratuitously taken and used. <laughs> and I'm going to do some more of that today. But anyway, this is one idea. And you can see that the church and the council house kind of oppose each other across this round plaza. Now, how do we know it's round? Because most plazas that we've dealt with in Mexico and St. Augustine and other places are square or rectangular. We know it because of the topographic mapping that was commissioned at the outset, that we can literally see a raised berm around this area that apparently was kept fairly clean. So here's another view with the Stations of the Cross basically around the um, um, 
plaza, also in the middle of the plaza, the ball game pole. And um, then a little more detail about the convento with uh, corrals for animals, um, storage, um, a little storage container here, perhaps a corn crib, and then gardens. And they've tried to, to replicate these things as well. So re remembering that basically there are Indians here, living here, and uh, so daily mass or mass on uh, holy days of obligation, these kinds of things would be required. Um, the ceramics, someone asked about ceramics this morning, ceramic technology uh, occurs very early in Florida. Probably we have the earliest radiocarbon dates now from anywhere in the southeast on, on pottery. Um, and it continues right up until the end. And I wish I understood it better. <laughs> this is true. Um, not knowing exactly who is at a particular mission site makes it very difficult to know whether this is Appalachian pottery or a blend of Appalachian and something else or some other group's pottery type. This is a mission church. Um, again, it's a large structure. Now, let's talk about stained glass. We don't have any. We don't even seem to have any window glass. So this large hole here is a source of light. And it is likely that it is the major source of life, light. It comes in over the choir loft and it would illuminate the, um, the, the altar. The most important thing in a 17th century Catholic service is what's happening on the altar. What's going on in the nave of the church is not that critical. So illuminating the altar is, is very critical. In the American Southwest, if you go to see any of the Southwestern missions and what they have there, because they have so little uh, rain, is very flat roofs. And oftentimes, they'll raise the area over the altar and they'll have a clear story so that light comes in and illuminates the altar from that direction. So again, what's, what's happening in the altar is the most important thing. And so that's probably enough. The nave would be relatively dim. I just put another picture in so you can see kind of the, the scale. These are two reenactors of uh, Spanish um, dress. This is what it looks like inside. Um, the second director of archaeology, Bonnie McEwen, spent a lot of time looking at California missions and also trying to find um, portraiture that was uh, reasonable for the period. These are reproductions of things that found, found in mission churches elsewhere. Uh, there are occasions when masses are held. The bishop usually comes about once a year and conducts a mass. So there are baptisms, there are weddings, there are many different kinds of events um, that are held at Mission San Luis. This, I was out there on um, the 10th, the 10th, 12th, the 12th, I guess, which, which was a Sunday. It was their Share the Love uh, event, which is always right before um, Valentine's Day. And so they do a variety of things, but one of the things they do is they reenact uh, a wedding. And uh, they have a group of um, actors, it's called um, Theater with a Mission, and uh, they perform a wedding ceremony. They also have a blessing of the animals every year, which is very popular. And at Cinco de Mayo, they have <laughs> a chihuahua um, co contest. <laughs> All right, the council house. This is the primary or the most important structure. Um, and I think you might think about what it costs to do these kinds of structures. I don't know how many palm trees died for this structure, but you'll see that things happen over time. All right, so this is what it looks like inside. These benches, there's a double row of benches. This is built on the archaeological model that uh, Shapiro first began to, to see in some of the first exca block excavations that were done. Beneath them are these cob pits. 
Now, all the cobs don't have kernels, so we do know that they are simply waste, and apparently they're used for, um, well, good riddance to mosquitoes and other kinds of things. I think it is Bartram who says that in the council houses these, or uh, in square ground houses, these benches are high enough that a flea cannot jump. So there may be other insect pests as well. So you can now see that it takes a little to keep this um, inside because here you can see that some of the palms are missing. There also are um, owls that sometimes roost in here. And most recently the church had, I don't know what you would call it, but an infestation of bats. But it smelled terrible. But they just got um, critter, critter getters to get rid of the bats. Tallahassee has had some bat problems in various places, some of them political. Uh, but anyway, um, so, but you can also see, given the size of the person standing there in the middle, how large the interior is. And it said at times that there were over a thousand people dancing and things of this sort in this space. All right, I want to talk a little bit about enculturation. How do we portray the Appalachians. I live in a town where people like to dress up like Indians and go to football games. <laughs> and, uh, you know, with concern about, um, well, simply concern for those kinds of things, we, we are really faced with a problem here. Because how do we actually show the population of Indians and the population of Spaniards. It tends to look an awful lot like a Spanish village, in my view. This, um, it's also possible by the time that this site will be destroyed in a, a year or so, that the Appalachians are wearing uh, pretty much European clothing. This is one of the things that the priests worry about in many places is getting them into European style clothing, preventing nakedness and things of this sort. So um, I think the idea at San Luis is to basically show people in, some, in European clothing, and that might be a better approach. All right, so the Convento again with the, the bell hung. This is a kind of campanile. It's not anywhere as developed as the ones that we see in, um, in California. So this is from the rear, basically. You can see the covered way. One of my students was so um, pleased. He was there when, and discovered the, the paired posts that was the covered way between the convento. The structure right here was actually built in the 1930s. It's the Messer House. And until the economic downturn, we had considered actually moving it off the property. It has a, it has a an elevator in it, and um, the berm that the house sits on is all the dirt from the elevator shaft, and we would very much like to see that, see what's in it, and get the house out of the way. But I think uh, financial things being as they are today, the house will stay. This is uh, one of the friar cells uh, inside the refectory basically, and then this looks back from the kitchen back toward the, a storage room adjacent to the refectory. And this is the kitchen, a Spanish style kitchen basically, with um, hanging things uh, for storage, and also the upper loft for storage as well. The garden, they try very hard to choose things that are typical of the period and that uh, they would have. This is a, an artist rendering of the uh, Spanish style house. This is a very interesting structure because it's a, a two-celled rectangular structure that sometimes we call a St. Augustine style plan. Um, we actually excavated one at the um, Patali mission. It was incredibly exciting. It, it was um, similar to this, and actually in the areas 
were the two rooms where you could literally see the, the flooring coming up. It was cut off. But the floor was a burned clay floor. I mean, it was burned so hard that roots did not penetrate. And so when you scraped up the root mass off that surface, you were actually on the 17th century surface that somebody had walked on. It had been burned, the, the mission itself had also been burned, probably in the 1647 revolt. This is uh, an interior shot. Um, they've done very well, I think, getting uh, different ceramicists in and around Tallahassee to make replicas of the kinds of things that have been found archeologically. So there is a real effort to, um, for, to rep, for you know, reasonable repl replication. Uh, this yoke in, on the side right here, there, there were ox carts. All right, so the mission is moved at this time. They are building a fortification um, and also this internal blockhouse. Uh, the Indians helped them do this, of course. And uh, occasionally, well, there are a few soldiers who are normally stationed, but in times of um, greater tension, there tend to be a few more. But the reality is, for all of Appalachia, that St. Augustine and, and Spain in general was never able to, to protect them, that they were truly out in a way, and whatever they could do in their own defense, it was what they could do. So basically, um, this, is, th this is not wooden. These are all cement, but they've been artfully <laughs> uh, painted to make them look like posts. Another view of it inside. There are several bastions on this. There's a, a dry moat around it. This is what it looks like inside. Benches basically for the uh, soldiers to sleep on across here. If you've been in the fort at St. Augustine, you've seen the same kinds of bench uh, arrangements there. The blacksmith, I think this is one of the funnest parts. I usually go and ask them if I can do the bellows. It's just a lot of fun. And, and also for my students to see nails made. I mean, they have no idea how nails are made. And so to see that the, the blacksmith just make a nail uh, is, is really interesting for them and, and pretty exciting. So this is what the gate looks like now. It comes in off Tennessee Street, which is the main east-west drag in Tallahassee. So, very recently, um, um, Mission San Luis got a new director. His name is uh, Dr. Jonathan Shepard. He's a historian. And uh, he's asked Florida State, the anthropology department, to do their field schools, uh, do our field schools there. And we'll start in spring 2018. And Dr. Tanya Perez, who has recently come to Florida State, although she is, is a, an alum, a bachelor's and a master's, but a PhD at Florida, um, she will do the work. She was in the 94 field school at Patali and was a teaching assistant for the 97 field school at the O'Connell site. So it's not as if she's just someone who's picking up and starting something new. Uh, and we do hope to see a lot of students have the experience of working on a Spanish mission site and helping us move more dirt so we see more of the site and we can uh, have more to contribute. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm just curious who manages, is it a state agency or who, who manages the, the uh, I think we're fortunate site? that this is not a state park. It is, <laughs> okay. I guess I hit a nerve. Um, but I think we're fortunate that it's not a state park. It's managed by the Department of State. And um, right now, for example, the reenactment program is much 
more developed or at least more active than the archaeological program. Um, so my hope is that Jerry Lee, who's mentioned here, Jerry's working on uh, a kind of artifact inventory, a report basically of all the artifacts that were found. And, and my hope is that I know that he has questions about some of the excavations they did where he felt maybe they didn't get to work there as, as long as they needed to. And we'll start, I hope, with some of those kinds of things and try to answer questions that he has. But um, it is the state, the Department of State, that administers the site. And it is well worth a visit if you're ever in Tallahassee. It's a pretty incredible place to be.